Yeah. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is part three of Lightning Obtainer Vidya Prapta, Bodhisattva Vidya Prapta Sutra. Part three. We're diving right in. There's no preliminary. If you don't know, you go back. You, you watch part one. You watch part two. You find out. You find out about the Buddha on Vulture's Peak. You'll find out about Bodhisattva, Vijaprapta, Lightning Obtainer, asking the Buddha, how does the Bodhisattva do it? You'll find out <laughs> that the Buddha tells us that there are these five hidden treasuries hidden treasuries of practice things that we didn't even know were there hidden treasuries and the buddha told us last time that there are these five hidden treasuries desire anger delusion an equal mix of all afflictions and then a super special hidden treasury of all imaginable phenomena, all dharmas, right? And if you were here last time, you know that we, we treaded uh, gracefully into the waters of desire, trying to parse out what the Buddha could, be, could mean uh, by these sort of practices, these hidden practices of the bodhisattva. Um, I'm going to make references to last week. I'm going to make references to our whole class on the hidden treasury of desire, but I don't want to, you know, start going back into the weeds of desire. Um, and so I'm going to be skipping directly in our Chang translation. I'm going to be jumping directly to page. 154 to the Buddha saying, and now Vijaprapta, and now lightning attainment. What is meant? What is the meaning of a bodhisattva's hidden practice, hidden treasury of the practices of anger? That's tonight, folks. Anger. So, Last week, we talked all about desire and sexuality and wanting and craving, and, mm, you know, all the, um, I had my, my karma ball up last week where the, the agent, the sensual, the sentient being, right, is understood as this kind of bound, this ball of greed, anger, and delusion, right? And so I talked about this ball and well you know sort of this new way of thinking about some old buddhist ideas the three poisons the three kleshas the three defilements the three afflictions if you've heard this language affliction defilement klesha it's all referring to these basic ideas and well Again, tonight, I'm not even going to go jump back to desire, and we're just going to deal with this idea of a bodhisattva and the practice of the bodhisattva and this practice of anger. And I kind of complicated that idea last week that this is a little wild because it's talking about the bodhisattva pra not, not practicing anger, like not getting better at being angry. But, well, what I mentioned last week is that, um, that this sutra is in particular not so much in the um, old school Theravada Shravaka way, dealing with one's own anger, greed, delusion. But the Bodhisattva path is sort of this idea of like dealing with anger. And I'm, a, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to like, you know, double down on my Bodhisattva practice. And it's like not even so much about your anger or the other's anger, 
but the bodhisattva is sort of like dealing with anger. Maybe it's here, maybe it's over there, maybe it's coming at me, maybe it's coming at you, but it's a little more less possessed. Let's put it that way, right? Here we go. Now, Bodhisattva Vijuprapta, what is meant by a Bodhisattva Mahasattva's hidden treasury of the practice of anger? Some living beings are prone to arrogance and conceit. They conceive that the I and the mine are real and cling to discriminations between self and other. Since, the, since those sentient beings never cultivate kindness or patience, their minds are corrupted with anger and other burning defilements. They are not mindful of the Buddha. They are not mindful of the Dharma. They're not mindful of the Sangha and are enveloped in wrath. They become confused about things. Yeah? Bodhisattvas never harm or irritate these ill-tempered beings, but think instead Strange, strange are these sentient beings, deluded, confused, and caught in all kinds of wrong views. They become angry and resentful in spite of the fact that all dharmas are by nature quiescent, detached, undefiled, non-composite, and beyond all contention. Thinking thus, the bodhisattva abides in great compassion and sincerely extends metta, loving kindness, towards those angry beings. In order to subdue their angry actions, the bodhisattva will tolerate such people with steadfast kashanti, patience, even if they are dismembered in their entire body. If all the innumerable, ill-tempered, angry beings were to betray each other and bear grudges against each other, thus dooming themselves to fall into the miserable plains of serpents when, when their karma ripens? The bodhisattva who abides in kashanti, patience, will use their merciful power to convert all of those angry beings, causing them not to fall into miserable planes of existence, but instead to realize equality without fail. Thus do bodhisattvas with ingenuity eliminate sentient beings' acts of anger. Okay, pause there. So this is, you know, I, I went through this, the first class and the second class. This is a sutra about the bodhisattva practice. Bodhisattva lightning attainment is pretty far along the bodhisattva path. Um, as I mentioned in the first and second class, the idea is that this bodhisattva has clear vision regarding the equality of what's called the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of dharmas, which we're gonna, we'll probably get back into in a little bit. But the idea is that this Bodhisattva is already abiding in a state of equilibrium, equanimity, or opeksha. And, well, what I would like to do actually really quickly is recontextualize the sutra, not recontextualize, but just 
uh, say again what's going on here. Or, yeah, I, I'm going to re-articulate. I'm going to rephrase it. Um, if, if you're a Dharma head, if you're a Dharma practitioner, you're very familiar, of course, with the three kleshas, the three defilements, the three afflictions, attraction, aversion, and confusion, or greed, hatred, and ignorance, desire, anger, delusion, all ways of saying the same idea. If you're familiar with those from this kind of old school view, then you might be familiar as well with the sort of original old school classic, classic Buddhist uh, practice, the, pra the classic Buddhist technique of developing mindfulness, which is being mindful of the arising of greed, anger, delusion, and, you know, the practice of mindfulness is sort of about uh, right effort, being aware of the arising of these things, and, you know, sort of being on top of your mind, being on top of your mind game, which is rather than allowing the anger, say, to snowball into full-blown screaming, you sort, of ch you sort of check it at the beginning. And you're kind of like, oh, whoa, what's this little anger? And so before it gets out of control, you control it. And that's the classic Buddhist practice regarding right effort is like these three afflictions arising in the mind. And mindfulness or a practice of mindfulness is about sort of, you know, subduing those things. If we, if we want to use the old good old fashioned garden analogy. We look at these as sort of weeds, weeds in the garden of the mind that should not be, you know, necessarily tended to and fertilized, but maybe somehow cut off. You know, versus in the old school classic Buddhist formula, versus virtuous acts, right? Of like giving, compassion, enlightenment knowledge, non-ignorance, non-confusion, non-delusion. But the idea is that there, there's these opposites of the three defilements. And if the little flowers, the little flowers of compassion, if the little flowers, the little sprouts of giving happen to arise in your mind, well, you might want to run over to that part of the garden and fertilize those flowers and tend to them. That is the analogy of old school Buddhism, to treat the mind like a garden, tend to it, watch out, and cultivate. Yes, beautiful. I, yes, <laughs> I'm always saying about old school classic Buddhism. Yes, <laughs> yes. But here's where it gets very interesting in terms of the Bodhisattva path. Again, I'm not going to go over lesson one and lesson two and all the other Dharma talks and sutras that we've discussed regarding bodhisattva vision, bodhisattva vision glasses that are so much about this sort of non-duality, um, the, you know, the arbitrary distinction of subject, object, me versus you. We're going to get back to it in a second, the problem with that disparity, right? But the idea that I want to, the idea that I want to plant, the little seed that I would like to plant in the garden of your mind tonight is that for the Bodhisattva, the idea is that the garden is everywhere. The mind is everywhere. I'm done thinking that the mind is just between my ears and behind my eyes. I'm done with that. The garden is everywhere. And so when I encounter the angry person, it's me, angry at myself. What do I got to do? Well, some living beings are prone to arrogance and conceit because they conceive that the I and the mine are real. They think it's real. I used to think it's real. I'm still mostly convinced it's real in that sense, right? But the right effort that I'm putting forth in my bodhisattva practice is sort of a, a you know, I'm trying to 
work with that idea. But some living beings are fully convinced that the eye and the mind are real, and so they're going to guard it very, very – they're going to guard it, right? And they're going to cling to discriminations between me and you, self and other. Get away from my stuff, right? And since those living beings never cultivate kindness and compassion, kindness or patience, actually, kashanti, their minds are all screwed up. Their minds are all corrupted with anger and other burning defilements. And they're not mindful of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. They're enveloped in wrath. And they're all confused. So these angry people, they're all confused, right? They're confused about things. But, but bodhisattvas never harm or irritate <laughs> these ill-tempered people because bodhisattvas are smart enough to go poking the bear, right? They don't want to irritate ill-tempered beings, right? But rather the bodhisattva thinks instead it's, it's so strange. It's so strange. They're so deluded and confused and caught in their wrong views. They become angry and resentful. In spite of the fact, right? In spite of the fact that all phenomena, all dharmas, anything you can imagine, all phenomena are by nature quiescent, detached, undefiled, non-composite and beyond contention. If you're a little confused about the language of being totally by nature quiescent, detached, undefiled, non-composite and beyond contention, see part one, because that is about the nature of this idea of the Dharma Dhatu in which all phenomena, any given phenomena, pair of glasses, telephone, what have you, any given phenomena, is a conceptual idea based on all other conceptual phenomena. And therefore, each and every conceptual phenomena contains every other conceptual phenomena. And if viewed in the right way, all phenomena are therefore kind of equally interdependent upon all other phenomena. And it's only the deluded attached mind that sort of says, no, 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 just this, and thinks that they can get just just this <laughs> and not that and not that and not that and not that so that's sort of a quick summary of this idea of the dharma dhatu this equality of the dharma dhatu and since this bodhisattva or bodhisattvas in general are in that zone they think thus that they will abide in great compassion and sincerely now the translation here says take pity take pity on sentient beings but i want you to know that the actual language is actually about meta m-e-t-t-a loving kindness because in the next paragraph we're going to up it a notch to karuna maha karuna great compassion and so I'm not a big fan of this language of pity. I find pity kind of Christian all too Christian. And it's unfortunate because what they're actually talking about is metta. This sort of first level Brahma Vihara, first formless abode of loving kindness. And so that's the first move of the Bodhisattva. You encounter anger, you meet it with metta, loving kindness. Okay. Anybody questions? Uh, oh, by the way, I do have one more comment about this idea of being dismembered piece by piece, being cut up. There is a very famous Jataka tale. Jataka tales are life's, uh, tales of the Buddha's life before he became the Buddha, even before he became, was reborn as Siddhartha, the prince, right? Uh, these Jataka tales, they tell these kind of, um, well, they're kind of morality tales, like moral tales about the Buddha's past lives. 
And when, when Mahayana sutras or any sutra actually, when they speak of patience, the actual Sanskrit word is kashanti. Kashanti or patience is one of the paramitas, right? It is, I believe, the third paramita. Kashanti gets translated a bunch of different ways. Patience, endurance, I've heard inclusiveness. There's a wide variety of ways to interpret or translate the idea of kashanti. What's always helpful in the process of translation or even more interpretation is not so much a uh, kashanti equals in, you know, endurance or whatever. What's more helpful in Buddhism is when you get a great story. You get a great story to tell you what Kashanti is, right? So that you don't even need to, um, what is it? You don't even need to translate it. You want to know what Kashanti is? Here's Kashanti. The Buddha in a past life was a ascetic, a forest dwelling ascetic. Um, and there was at that time this um, pretty vicious, malicious, angry dude uh, named King Kali, K A L I. King Kali had a reputation for being a very, very angry, bad dude. And one day, King Kali and his um, harem, his, uh, his, uh, consorts all of his wives they go to the woods for a picnic they have a lovely picnic they're drinking and king kali basically gets drunk passes out and all of his wives his harem they get bored so they go off wandering in the woods and they find uh, mega i believe his name was the the ascetic who was a previous incarnation of the buddha who is sitting there meditating and when he sees the, all these, uh, the women come, he's like, yeah, have a seat. Have you heard about the Dharma? And he starts telling them all about the Four Noble Truths and all this stuff. And they're, in, you know, they're totally enraptured with the Dharma. The story is, is that King Kali wakes up and he's like, whoa, where is everybody? What's going on? I'm confused. I'm desirous. I'm angry. And so he goes into the woods looking for his wives. And oh snap, he finds them surrounding, surrounding this young man who's sitting there talking, doing some crazy thing like talking, right? King Kali is furious. And so he goes charging up to the ascetic, Mega. And of course, the ascetic is like, you know, please have a seat. I'll, t I'll teach you the Dharma too. And King Kali pulls out a, his sword and cuts his, the mega, cut, cuts the ascetic's hand off. <laughs> so then the, 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 the ascetic mega, he goes, no, please really have a seat. And King Kali cuts his other hand off. And he's like, no, really. He cuts his arms off, cuts his other arm off, cuts his legs off, cuts his And the story is, is that King Kali is so angry that he ev eviscerates, I believe is the word, eviscerates the ascetic, chopping him limb for limb. That is actually what is referenced in this sutra, where it says that in order to subdue the angry actions of sentient beings, they will tolerate such people with steadfast kashanti, even if they dismember their bodies. It is, that's a reference to that Jataka tale. If you are familiar with the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, in one of the chapters regarding kashanti, he says, it's like when the King Kali tried to dismember me piece by piece. At no point did I have any anger towards him. That's the lesson of Kushanti. That at no point, all of this anger, all of this hatred, all of this violence was coming at 
the ascetic, and at no point did they develop animosity or hatred towards King Kali. That's Kashanti. And please do not take this in any way as a message about suffering abuse. Please do not do that. Please take this about the profound message of having such a heart that you extend loving kindness even towards your assailant. I believe somebody once said something about turn the other cheek or something to that effect. And I, that is what we're talking about. So please, again, do not take this as like, oh, the Bodhisattva just suffers abuse. And that, that's what makes a Bodhisattva Bodhisattva. No. What makes a Bodhisattva Bodhisattva is that they extend still loving kindness, even though they're being abused. So there is no excuse for violence here. It's, we're not talking about that. But what we are talking about is what do you do? What do you do, Bodhisattva, when they come at you with the anger? You gonna meet it with anger? Uh, are you gonna meet the anger with the anger? Are you gonna perpetuate the problem? Or how's, how's the cultivation of the, the garden of the earth going? If you're meeting the anger with the anger, right? So I just want to make that very clear about what the message is in terms of the meta loving kindness, even towards your assailant, right? So before we move on, questions, comments, ideas, everybody good? Awesome, because it gets better. We have a lot of places to go and we got plenty of time. So. Furthermore, Bodhisattva, Vidyaprapta. When Bodhisattvas see angry people, they think all phenomena, all dharmas, are pure by nature. Because they do not understand the dharma's nature, these angry living beings act according to the appearance of things vainly making distinctions or vainly making discriminations and feel anger in spite of the fact that all dharmas are equal and beyond contention. If they saw the true nature of dharmas, they would not bear grudges against each other. But since they do not, they become angry. Bodhisattvas will then redouble their kindness and abide in Mahakaruna, great compassion for those beings. Fulfilling their past vows, they explain the Dharma to those angry beings, revealing various teachings with effortless wisdom to put an end to their angry actions. However, they will not think that they teach the Dharma to eliminate those sentient beings' anger. Why is that? Because bodhisattvas have insight into the nature of the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of reality, the realm of Dharmas. This is how a bodhisattva abides securely in the undifferentiated dharma dhatu and how they eliminate defiled actions. All right, so before we get to the examples, um, I, yeah, I think, I think we're going to get to both, we're, we're kind of in the anger treasury, the hidden anger treasury tonight. And I think we're even going to get to the delusion one because they're both a little short. And so I'm going to kind of pre uh, pre preface, preface the delusion talk with um, this, this talk here. So last week I put up the 
karma ball, this idea that in original Buddhism, we're, we are these kind of balls of our, whatever our desires and aversions and confusion is, that's what you are, <laughs> that, right? So a ball of your, those particular confusions, desires and anger in that way. But this is a Mahayana Bodhisattva Sutra, so it's interesting, interested in kind of complicating the nature of the three defilements. And it's something that is present in the English translation. This is, it's present in the English translation, but it's even more present in the Chinese. And, and I have my notes here. These are my Chinese notes that I didn't, they were up in the board last time, but I didn't talk about them. And what it is, it's, um, it's a very subtle teaching in this sutra. It's, it's why you come to me for the, for the real subtle stuff that, you know, other people might miss, right? And so when we progress from the desire to anger to delusion in regards to this idea of the Dharma Datu, right? The interpenetrating realm of reality, right? In regards to the Dharma Datu, this sutra has a very upayic, poetic presentation of ideas regarding the Dharma Datu. And what I mean, and I'm just going to say this very bluntly, very quickly, so that then we can digress and really dig into it. Regarding the realm of reality, the Dharma Dattu, in speaking about wanting, craving, desire, attraction, how do you deal with wanting, craving, desire, attraction in regards to the, this, this equal realm of the Dharma Dattu? Well, well, that's a, that's a very fascinating Chinese expression that I'm not even going to get into. But ultimately, what it means is this idea of non-duality. So the idea of greed, of wanting this, which I think I don't already have, the, you know, the idea of greed is that it kind of works based on duality. Oh, look, oh, look at that over there, ah, you know? So it's like, so a meditation or contemplation or, yeah, kind of meditation contemplation on non-duality is sort of an implicit remedy for desire, according to this sutra. I didn't mention this last time because we hadn't gotten very far along and I didn't think it would make sense, but I think it's going to make sense tonight. And so now, friends, what is the sort of antidote to anger? Well, it's about this idea of, well, it's at the end of what I just read. Yeah, it was at the end of what I just read because I try to be a good Dharma teacher. So this is how Bodhisattvas abide securely in the undifferentiated Dharma Dattu. And that's how they eliminate defile actions. So it's not about duality. It's this subtle idea of distinctions or difference. This is subtler. This is subtler than just subject object because one could conceivably, arguably, be very deep in non-duality, but still very steeped in distinctions. Does that make sense, everybody? I hope, right? Uh, that you could, you could get over the whole me, it thing but then the idea of just distinctions in general. Michael, um, yeah, Connie, here. I, I, I don't. I was waiting I, for you. <laughs> no, but I actually don't, don't really get it yep. in a sense. So, do you hear me? Yeah, I do. I yeah, just okay, came cool. 
Yes. Okay, great. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit more what do you think, uh, um, your opinion about distinction in, in that context? So, yep. Yeah. So this is this very, very subtle idea, of course, because even, even that action of dualism of me and it is subtle, but extreme, of course, in that, in that sense of creating the delusion illusion of inside outside it's very extreme and so again if you can imagine i can imagine a variety of meditation practices that result in a kind of dissolution of that sense of subject object but is still very aware of the distinctions between all kinds of things so by distinctions it's kind of sort of like this from that high from low um shiva from not shiva or ishvara from not ishvara the sublime from the not sublime the transcendent from the not transcendent there's so many distinctions that could be made in the non-dual realm of no subject object yeah right so it's sort of like even going deeper into senses of distinction one crazy distinction is like me from you but then if i get over that and i'm like okay yeah i'm kind of vibing on this dharma datu or whatever i'm kind of vibing on this idea that's cool but i could still have all kinds of discriminations distinctions even though i'm kind of over the whole me you one Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes a little bit more sense. Thank you. Again, these are very subtle, like they're like way down here kind of teachings. So mm -hmm. they're they're it's not just like, oh got it, thanks. It's like right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey Michael. Yeah. So uh, can you hi, this is my little cat Catalina, by the way. She's like, hello. Great to finally see you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so can you, so how does that, how is that an antidote then to anger? Maybe you were going to go into that. Oh yeah. And actually the example that the Buddha back is about to give is, is, is that. Okay. <laughs> so we're not, yeah, we're not done with this. I actually just wanted to say this so that now the next part will make sense. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still struggling a little bit with, I, I see what you said about how you could still be understand non-duality and still be making these distinctions. And so I guess I'm really curious to hear the next part to see if that helps that concept oh, yeah. as well. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Everybody good? All right. So let's get to the example of non-differentiated, right? That's the idea. So yeah, I mean, Tanya, you're right. It's like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> So I just wanted to set us up so that we would know. Vijaprapta, lightning attainment, bodhisattva. For, for example, good old example. The underlying nature of both darkness and light is the same. They are both like undifferentiated empty space. Therefore, darkness is never really dispelled when light appears. But it cannot be said that it is not dispelled, kind of like in a normal phenomenal sense. Likewise, similarly, bodhisattvas who rely on the wisdom of non-differentiation of the Dharma Datu can skillfully elucidate the Dharma to eliminate the various angry actions of sentient beings. And at the same time, they make no distinctions within the Dharma Datu. So, okay. I, I really like that alone. It would it would branch off into Vijaprapta Sutra Part Three A, 
B, C, D, and we would be here for years talking about this idea that, my gosh, right? That the underlying nature of both darkness and light is the same, that they are both like undifferentiated empty space. This is like, I, I, I this is a kind of a thing that because I want to like, I don't know, not spin this out <laughs> into so many lessons, I got to just say it and bounce. <laughs> and so what, if you understood the lesson of, I don't even have all of my, my props and stuff, but you've, if you understood the lesson of the Dharma Dhatu, how any given phenomena in order to be that secretly, hiddenly contains all other phenomena conceptually, even the idea of light and dark fall into that idea. And so that even though we are prone to think of darkness as the opposite of light, in a very, very deep, subtle way, you could not even conceive of the light without the darkness in that way. They are so bound up together in that way. And this is actually, this is what I mean by I could sp split off for kalpas about this idea of lightness and darkness. And I've, I've, I've given Dharma talks about this before, which is this idea about, well, I'm being blunt here. So about the true light of wisdom, the true light of wisdom, of knowledge versus this, uh, this, this light. This is some, this is a, a distinction like any other distinction in terms of light and dark, just as diluted. And so that idea that even our conception of what we can see versus what we can't see, what's in the light, what's in the dark, um, I would, if anybody's like, tell me more, tell me more, this is crazy, please see the Shurangama Sutra. <laughs> the Shurangama Sutra is all about this idea of the light and the dark and how it is that this terrestrial phenomenal light that we play with is really just another distinction like, I don't know, a piece of lint. We think it's like what we think to see. It's actually just another distinction like any other. And that's why when you're deep in the Dharma Dhatu, this realm of undifferentiation, the Buddha can tell you something like, Dar darkness is never really dispelled when light appears, but it can't be said that it's not dispelled. <laughs> Right. So again, I'm not even gonna, cause I would, I can't, I can't. I'm gonna move on. What I found, what I found fascinating that he, the the sutra pretty or the explanations pretty late in the game, so to speak, mention um, mentions um, the quality of emptiness. Because in this paragraph you just mentioned, he describes of the empty space, right? So when I think about duality, um, non-duality, I, I think about the quality of emptiness. I'm just surprised that it comes so late, the shunyata and um, the quality of emptiness. We, I think we didn't have it before. We didn't have it in the section of desire, did we? We didn't, and I want to, Connie, I, just to be clear, this is not shunyata. This is not emptiness. This is akasha, space, um, separation. Mm -hmm. And although even the Buddha says akasha or the idea of space, what I like to call allowance, like sp space, meaning like space, space, akasha, and emptiness are... Well, they're like cousins in that way. They're like, if you want to, if you want to like get to know emptiness, you might want to meet Akasha first. You might want to meet space first. So they're very, very related, but this is actually talking about Akasha or mm -hmm. just space. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because it's like,
space you know space is tricky i've done you know these different dharma talks on space but but like space is still a little i don't know what uh, like i don't want to say terrestrial it's still a little like human all too human still like because the whole idea is that phenomena as i understand it to to even conceive of the whiteboard versus michael versus this requires space so there's a way in which the the phenomenal world and space are kind of like really together and that's why the formless realms of dhyana are very accessible and very interesting shunyata or emptiness is extraterrestrial <laughs> it shunyata is like mm, no, nah, it's not relative to uh, form. It's not relative to objects. It's not relative to anything. It's utterly inconceivable. And so in many ways, Connie, real shunyata, real emptiness is operating in the background of the sutra. Like, because in many ways, the Dharma Datu, the whole idea of the Dharma Datu can only be arrived at once you've kind of shot through the portal of emptiness. So it's sort of in the background. But when this, when this particular chapter says that it's all like light and darkness or both like empty space, th that's sort of, a, it's a certain statement that is like really crazy and profound and nice to think about. So. Mm -hmm. But one one thing, and I know we, I think I have to look up, you know, the understanding of, of space. I, I remember when we you talked about it months ago, I really had a hard time to to understand it. But just one, the, the space that is referring to here is not meant in the three-dimensional world, right? It's Is it beyond three-dimensional world or is it tied to the three, three, 3D dimension? All right, Connie. It's off topic, huh? <laughs> it's off topic. No, no, no. It's actually, it's right on topic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I had it. I had it too. Yeah. Well, I put a note down and I will, um, I will, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. That one really was, that was unfortunate because I had it. I mm. had it. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You prompted it. You, if you probably said your question again, it would come back. I forget exactly how you worded that. It was, how did you word the distinction between space and emptiness? Well, that space is embedded or arises, I don't know, from the 3D level of understanding of reality. Um, question mark. <laughs> is... <laughs> Is this under quality? Oh, that's of what it was. Okay. That's what it was. Oh, hold on to it. MC, <laughs> hold on to it. Um, Let it out. Yeah, yeah. It's about how, you know, this is what I've, I've, uh, this is really profound. And it, and it, if I can articulate it, it, it it's worth all of this uh, stammering. The, whether we're talking about light and dark in the terrestrial 3D sense, right? Um, that's over here, light and dark, terrestrial 3D sense. Space allowance for, in order for there to be anything. Both light and this other thing that we're talking about, which is the emergence out of space or out of out of formlessness in that way they are both referring to um uh conceptualization how it is how do i know what the hell i'm looking at how do i know what i'm looking at and so the idea is is that you know <laughs> okay ah uh, it's there's a bunch of people that are about to laugh. <laughs> I really need to print this up.
because I think it's really significant that you know it really points to the understanding of reality and what we perceive. I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be going through all of this I didn't if I didn't agree. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example that I use often to describe this idea of like the emergence the emergence of phenomena based on or out of or dependent upon space. So there it is. Now, depending on what you conceived of as vacuous empty space versus solidity determines whether you are looking at a glass or two faces. So let me ask you, did I just show you a glass or did I just show you two faces? Well, depending on how you discriminate space, meaning is space black or is space white? What's, where's the space? What, so the mystical aspect of space is that it's up to you, Connie. It's up to all of us to decide where the space is and based on where we say the space is, that's where we find out what it is. Because if this is space, it's a glass. But if this is space, it's two faces. Mm. So the emergence of phenomena, the understandability, the conceivability of phenomena is very much <laughs> dependent on space. Mm -hmm. If you followed that, then the Buddha's really profound, deep thing about light and darkness is exactly the same message. And it's crazy. It's really insane to think that, oh my gosh, you mean I'm just sort of privileging the whiteness here? Oh, did I just say that? Yes, I did. But that's the idea here, folks, is that this is some deep discrimination type stuff going on regarding our reality. And there's a way in which the deepest message here regarding Connie's question and this crazy tangent I just went on is that uh, you're the driver here. You're the one that's in the land of glasses or faces. That's you. And now you're off either pursuing a bunch of glasses or pursuing people. But you, you've made distinctions out of space to go off doing that. And I actually think, Connie, thank you so always. My, wow, thank you so much. Because this, I think for me, helped clarify even in my own mind, the difference, pardon the expression, between non-duality versus distinction. Because if I may, both of these are not me. Hmm. But distinguishing glass versus faces, mm -hmm. that's what's at stake in, in terms of this, uh, I guess, anger or in terms of the non-differentiated nature of the Dharma Dhatu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, no, it, it helps a lot. I think the space that you just um, described and the distinction aspect of it is tied to, and then we can stop the conversation about it, but it's very much also tied to conditioning, right? The con individual conditioning. And Shunyat, on the other hand, and non-dualism has nothing to do with conditioning per se. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Really can I follow up? So then the non-distinction in that example that you were showing would be to not distinguish between the black or the white in that image. Yeah, kind of, sort of. The This bodhisattva position is a very, you know, um, uh, embracing, broad-minded acceptingness in that way. So I think it's about sort of like, I think it's about realizing the limitations of distinctions. And then the, the flip side of that is the liberation of non-distinction, if that makes sense. <laughs> all right are we gonna well let's see any more questions ideas comments that was a great conversation by the way i really appreciated all that 
Um, cool. So, Vijaprapta, just like the sunlight, light of the sun, just as sunlight is never separated from the sun wherever it shines. So, whatever bodhisattvas teach to subdue and destroy sentient beings' angry actions is the wheel of the Dharma. Because they do not differentiate any dharmas in the universe. <laughs> so, uh, just because I do want to kind of move this ahead, that's a great line about Upaya saying this idea that the bodhisattva, knowing the minds of various sentient beings, depending on whatever they decide is the right move at that moment, if it's skillful and Upayak, that's the Dharma wheel. Even if they've told you to have contact with sensual desire, like in the last section. That's the idea here. Noam, did you have something? I Noam, I saw your... Yeah. Um, I, I don't think you went back to Tanya's question, which is oh. why is the, is the remedy for anger non-distinction where the remedy for desire was non-duality? That was going to help amplify things, I think. Or did I miss it? Did you say oh no 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 um yeah 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 great um i suppose the idea in that is that you know if you think about the idea of wanting something it being not you is sort of essential to that idea anger however requires no other but does require evaluation if I may, right? Because anger is kind of predicated on like, either like, you know, whatever. I mean, really just think about any instance of anger and kind of like see how it's about an evaluation of either justice and injustice, right and wrong, you know, all kinds of phenomena that are, are uh, nest, I don't want to say necessary, but are sort of a cause for anger, and that anger doesn't necessarily need the other. Yeah, and you know, that's you know, not to say that lesson, lesson on greed is not applicable to lesson on desire, but I think, in terms of like the way the sutra is reading, it's sort of there's this um, mainline Dharma teaching going on, and I'm kind of giving you this uh, sub line which is the way in which I noticed in the English. So what happened was is I noticed in the English that there was a very subtle distinction going on and where the Dharma Dhatu in desire was all about being non-dual. And then in the anger, it was all about non-differentiated. And then the delusion, which I would love to get to, by the way, which I think we have time to, is a whole other idea. And I saw a Upayak progression at a subliminal, or not subliminal, but at a, at a subline level. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so very quickly then, this is just the end of the, of the hidden treasury of practices for anger, right? That those sentient beings are afflicted by 21,000 types of anger and all kinds of other wrong actions in all 84,000, a bodhisattva with effortless wisdom can teach the appropriate dharma to cope with their angry actions without conceiving the notion that they are teaching, have taught, or will teach the dharma to anyone. <laughs> this is what is meant by a great bodhisattva's hidden treasury of the practice of anger. Once bodhisattvas have acquired this hidden treasury, they can, for a kalpa or more, teach the Dharma skillfully in various terms to fulfill the desires or wishes of sentient beings. Although sentient beings' angry actions know no bounds, the bodhisattva's wisdom and eloquence are also inexhaustible. This is how a bodhisattva who has acquired the hidden treasury of the practice of anger expounds 
the undifferentiated nature of the Dharma Datu upayakli, <laughs> skillfully. All right, that's the end of the anger. You might have, if you recall, these end, the desire ended the same way. There were 21,000 types of desire and a bunch of other afflictions, totally 84,000. The Bodhisattva understands them all in that way. Being able to deliver just the right teaching or just the right Dharma at just the right time. Yeah? Is everybody ready for their new favorite vo vocabulary word? Are you ready for your new favorite vocabulary word? So for all of you node heads out there, all you node heads talking about your nodes, I got a better one for you. All right. So now, Bodhisattva Vidyuprapta, what is meant by a Bodhisattva Mahasattva's hidden treasury of deluded practices or practices for the deluded? Moha confusion? Vidyuprapta. It is very difficult. It is a very difficult task for bodhisattvas to cope with the deluded. <laughs> because such people pursue deluded actions. They feel malice towards others. They're wrapped in a shell of ignorance, like silkworms wrapped in their own cocoons. They are unable to adapt themselves wisely to dharmas, to phenomena. And they are not keen in observing a proper course of action. They cling to the view of a self. They follow all kinds of wrong paths. They're very slow to progress and are unable to extricate themselves from samsara. For the sake of such deluded beings, the bodhisattva, soon after the first stage of engendering bodhicitta, they bodhisattvas make great intensified efforts untiring, untiringly and ceaselessly. They consider how they should teach the Dharma under what circumstances, and how best to interpret it. All in order to cause deluded people to follow the bodhisattva's practices and achieve liberation. Bodhisattvas who in the past have gained insight into the Dharma Dhatu will abide in great compassion by virtue of their effortless wisdom and knowledge of the Dharma Dhatu. When they encounter sentient beings who are ignorant of the Dharma Dhatu, they will tame them by explaining the Buddha's teachings according to their capacities. Yet, without conceiving any notion that they are teaching, have taught, or will teach the Dharma to anyone, and because of the power of their past vows, they clearly see the concatenation of all events in the universe and are able to open simultaneously hundreds of thousands of Dharma doors to prevent sentient beings from, from performing actions out of ignorance and thereby leading them to liberation. Let's see. Let me just finish this just to make sure. Bodhisattva, Vijiprapta, consider, for example, a good physician who is proficient at curing diseases. With their great knowledge of medical works, they can diagnose any disease as soon as they see its symptoms and then cure it with the right spells or the right medicines. In the same way, a bodhisattva who has insight 
into the Dharma Dhatu can teach the Dharma with effortless wisdom for habitually deluded beings in accordance with their various inclinations, causing them to know hundreds of thousands of Dharmas. Vijayaprapta. This is what is meant by a great Bodhisattva's store of wisdom for the deluded or the confused. Once Bodhisattvas have acquired this hidden store, they will have deep insight into the concatenation of all events in the universe and can, for a kalpa or more, teach the Dharma in many different terms for those deluded beings in accordance with their various inclinations and wishes. While their delusions are boundless, the Bodhisattva's wisdom and eloquence are also inexhaustible. A Bodhisattva who has acquired this hidden store of the practices of deluded can, in this manner, expound the Dharma upayakly or skillfully and without making any distinctions. In order to eliminate the 21,000 deluded actions and other wrong actions, 84,000 in all, a Bodhisattva teaches hundreds of thousands of Dharmas. This is the explanation of the Bodhisattva's hidden treasury of the practices for the deluded. Okay, we're not going any further. We got a little time to talk about the concatenation of all events in the universe. <laughs> so this was a new word to me, concatenation. Went looking it up and I was like, oh, wow. That's a very interesting word or idea that for me, I found very, um, what is it? Syn I say synonymous with the term node, like the idea of looking at nodes in a system. But what I liked about concatenation is it actually eliminated any sense of individuality of a node and put it more in this idea of a concatenation, this kind of, interdependent i don't even know what a concatenation is besides an interdependently and in, you know connected ball of phenomena it's a very interesting word again i was not even aware of it as an english word until reading this what's interesting though for the dharma heads in the audience is that when you come across in an english translation of a buddhist sutra a phrase like the concatenation of all events in the universe you have to wonder <laughs> what what is what is uh garma chong and friends what are they translating as the concatenation of all events in the universe it's actually two chinese characters you gotta love chinese you gotta love chinese for the ability to reduce apparently down into just two simple pictograms the idea of the concatenation of all events in the universe but if you go, uh, you know, you get your dictionaries out, you do a little bit of research, and you find out that what, well, I didn't have to do any research. <laughs> I already knew what these words meant. And I was like, really? Oh, well, that's a very wonderful way to translate that in, as the concatenation of all events in the universe. This is the Chinese uh, bino binome binomial expression for pratitya samudpata, dependent origination. That's it. So you could then go back and say that because of the power of the bodhisattva's past vows, they clearly see dependent origination and are able to open spontaneously hundreds of thousands of dharma doors. I like concatenation of all events in the universe as a, uh, as a shorthand, longhand for Pratitya Samudpata dependent origination. Um, you know, because we're running a little, you know, time's running a little out and I have things to say about this. The whole first lesson I did about the Dharma Dhatu and the alphabet and how each letter of the alphabet contains all letters of the alphabet and then all phenomena like a pair of glasses are basically a letter in the alphabet of your world. This is a letter and that like how the letter A 
needs the letter B in order to be the letter B. These glasses need my eyes in order to be what they are. And that interdependent relationship between all phenomena in the universe or the concatenation of all events in the universe is pratitya samudpata or dependent origination. So this progress of meeting greed with non-duality, meeting anger with non-distinctions, and then eating, meeting delusion with complete clarity about the interdependent nature of all phenomena, otherwise known as the concatenation of all events in the universe. <laughs> Questions about that or anything in this section regarding delusion? I, I have a comment. I, it's probably, I don't know of what interest it is, but uh, the word concatenate in, in spreadsheet language means to take two pieces of information and put them together with no space between them. So you use it a lot in, in massaging uh, text, textual data. Like if you have a, first, a field for first name and a field for last name and you want a field for full name, you concatenate first name, space, last name. That's what it means in spreadsheet language. Oh. Together in a particular order. So That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, Everybody else? Right? It's kind of like seeing the world as a giant hyphenated noun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just one of those like German Uber words. That includes, like, every possible word. It goes on forever, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a beautiful idea. But it's actually... Uh, it is a beautiful idea because I actually think it evokes the very essence of what we're talking about, which is the interconnected nature of all phenomena, that it is the mind that gets rid of the hyphens, <laughs> right? That sort of says, no, 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 no. It's a pair of glasses and some eyeballs and a dude and some ears. It's like, it's all a bunch of different stuff. You know, I don't want to, you know, devolve back into the space conversation, I want to stay on this Dharmadhatu. But again, I want you to see this beautiful, um, oh, I don't even know. It's part of like, it's part of why I love sutras is that there's so many levels and layers to these things. And like, you know, on the surface level, there's this beautiful wisdom about like, yeah, you meet somebody um, angry meet them with meta you meet somebody with delusion have patience and compassion for them and try to like you know get their mind right or whatever right and by the way i didn't mention this because i didn't want to I, I didn't want to start wading back into the the weeds of desire but part of the message actually of that first or last session the first treasury on desire it was kind of about how like the bodhisattva gives the person what they desire. It's sort of this like appeasement and then I'll teach you the Dharma because now you've settled down. Like you were so frantically wanting whatever it was. Let me just give you it and now we'll talk. And so it's kind of a form of, of dana or giving. Of course, the sutra was about sex, which was pretty wild and you know, I, I tried to make very clear that I, you know, I'm, I'm wide open to various interpretations of what that meant in terms of the Bodhisattva's practice. Was the Bodhisattva supposed to be having sex with people in order to get them enlightened or whatever? I'm not sure. But the message does seem to be about meeting people's desire with a sort of giving, meeting the anger with compassion, and meeting delusion with wisdom. If I couldn't kind of paraphrase the lesson that way but if we go back you know to this this very subtle progression um what can i say this is important to say in my experience of reading these sutras to reading um, buddhist texts 
I would, how can I say this? I would suggest not to think of um, these three teachings regarding the Dharma Dhatu, non-duality, non-discrimination, and then the concatenation of all events, that that's a progression that is not necessarily concurrent or or something with the the kleshas. What do I want to? I want to say that I think this is you know the way these sutras are. They're very poetic, and so I don't want anybody walking away thinking that that meditation on the concatenation of all events is just as good for desire. <laughs> It's just as good for anger or thinking of non-distinctions is just as good for desire. It's just as good for delusion. So what I mean is that these lessons are running concurrently, but are not necessarily corollary or something like you kind of really have to not, not cling and not be rigid in thinking this means that this means that, and this only pertains to this. And this only pertains to that. It's like, these are, it's very subtle teachings where they're trying to actually teach you 10 things at once, you know? And so I just want you to know that or, or not even know that, but think about that. N know what you know, you know? <laughs> Questions, answers, ideas about delusion, moha, confusion, independent origination. Everybody good? Could I could use another question because I'm kind of not really fully ready to jump into the next section because ma mainly yeah, actually the <laughs> aff aff afflictions, I've got a great drawing that I want to do. So I don't even want to get into afflictions because I, I want to draw my drawing. So. Hayden, I have a small, a tiny question, basically, um, which is just in regards of structure. I'm a little bit surprised that um, when we started a sutra, that we didn't actually start with delusion and then went on to desire and anger. So, because for me, in my, you know, small little world, delusion is the, the, the root cause of, not the root cause, but the the source, yeah, the roots, the source of, you know, this this conditioning we have with desire and anger. So, do you know why the sutra explains desire first and then anger and then delusion? Is there a structure or it's just random? And oh no, I don't think it's uh, random. Um. Yeah. Um, you know, Connie, once again, you're, you're already there. So yeah, yeah, this is the one, this is the one. And if you are familiar with the 12 link chain of causation, you're familiar with Pratitya Samapata dependent origination, you'll know that that link in the 12 links, that link of ignorance avidya not knowing what's going on here that that's the problem it's like yeah all the other links are problems too but that's the that's the one and so you're right Connie. that's this is the this is the one and i think that you know if you're if if that's where you're at stay there to, you know this yeah there's no reason to, to to go back into some this is kindergarten stuff dealing with with these and that's exactly my answer or my point is the idea is is that as children and by that i mean like clinging suffering selves right but as as like infantile minds this is sort of like first the most obvious yeah desire and anger is the most obvious yeah yeah and it it like you know, even now that I'm really thinking about it at a deeper level, it's like, you know, even this idea, this fundamental problem of like clinging to the self is a form of desire. 
right? There's a way in which, yes, I don't want to complicate this too much psychologically. So, but there's a way that we're sort of not, insofar as we think of ourselves as a self, it's not angry at ourselves. We want ourselves. We cling to ourselves. We're angry at other people, but we sort of love ourselves. And again, I don't want to complicate this psychologically in terms of people that don't love themselves. And it's not about that. I mean, that the, you can dharmically think of the fundamental idea of attachment to the self or the idea of a self as a weird form of like desire and wanting. And then when somebody gets in my space, you know, then we have some anger issues and all of that. But yes, Connie, all of that, all of that is arising out of the confusion, the delusion, and the moha. And so, yeah, I answer, I answer the question. I think upayakly it starts us off at the most basic, goes right. to the next, goes us to the most sublime, and that's the teaching. And because, Connie, again, you're, it's like I'm working on that. I think that's the root. I'm here to say yes do don't don't even worry about these then. don't even worry about these then in that way okay but thank you michael mm -hmm. i have a question yeah. it's kind of it's like could maybe someone who is in delusion be deluded to thinking that other people should not be open to in a kind of context uh, rephrase that a little or uh, like is someone that would be not open to sh um, um, the desire of the wanting the letting someone being open maybe be deluded for not seeing that exactly Ig okay exactly Exactly. Yeah. And that's cool. where you, you and Connie should get together and have tea because <laughs> the idea that is exactly the idea that this is really the, the root. It's why I mentioned the 12 link chain of causation, that it's the root cause. And if you, you know, you just kind of take a step back and remember all of your dharma. It's like, oh, yeah, he, they keep talking about ignorance and enlightenment. It's like a very, um, for, for me personally, it's a very special part of this teaching, meaning the Dharma, meaning Buddhism, that it's this idea of, of seeing clearly and that we're not seeing clearly and we're not seeing clearly because of sort of these things we're doing, wanting, being angry and stuff. And I personally find that very liberating next to a tradition that says, oh yeah, all you got to do is like meditate for 20 years and achieve these like 10 stages. And then after those, you could achieve those. And then, after, and then you give me some money and da, 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 and then you're good. Or, or, you know, or whatever variation of the idea where like the solution is given to me, but it's like, oh, wow. I mean, I got to give all that up and you mean I got to do all that and I got to do that and that, and that versus a teaching where it's like, I'm not saying it's easy to see clearly, but it's kind of a simple prescription, if that makes sense. So. Simple prescription. All right, folks, so please, you know, I, you know I'm gonna uh, just summarize this beautiful, section on delusion with this analogy that I, I it's like i said this at the beginning i said this in the first lesson i said it last time yes this is a bodhisattva sutra so it's talking about dealing with others and other people's anger and other people's desire and other people's delusion and how does the bodhisattva mitigate that and then turn it into a teaching opportunity but I said in the first and second lesson, there's a way too to remember you have a you you have a mind, you have greed, anger, delusion, and so to the degree to which we're not ten stage non regressing bodhisattvas, this is all you know lessons for ourselves as well. And on that note, this line that because because people pursue deluded actions. 
feel malice towards others, they are wrapped up in the shell of ignorance, like silkworms wrapped in their own cocoons, and they are unable to adapt themselves wisely to phenomena. So it's a, a you know, again, if you encounter somebody that you think is deluded or the degree to which you're reflecting on your own delusion, think of this silkworm all bound up, all protecting themselves in some way, right? And that kind of way, it's like, call it, you know, narcissism, <laughs> call it my, my op myopicism i don't even know how to say that if there's such a word but the of, of the state of being myopic that state of being so you know like that like a silkworm bound up is the buddha's analogy for delusion and so at some point maybe michelle or connie somebody spoke of this idea of the opening up it wasn't even my language. Somebody else introduced it. And you're truly bodhisattva, this idea that the, the movement is this opening up. And that's quite the opposite of being a cocooned uh, silkworm. So. And on that note, folks, I'm going to wind it down. I want to thank you all so much for another great Dharma Doors. We have two more hidden treasuries it just gets funner from here. And so I don't know if that's going to be two nights. I don't know if it's going to be one night. You never know. So I hope to see you next Sunday at 7. Thank you. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'll say a few words here about the Dharma Collective. I think, I think everyone here knows that the Dharma Collective is run entirely by volunteers on a Donna basis. Um, we, uh, who do some of the organizing, freely give of our time. If you have extra time and you're interested in contributing to the Sangha in some way, particularly now that we're all online, we have a ton of things um, that we could use help with from like, you know, all these videos are going on YouTube now. We could use help with that. Um, so we have an email address that you could email if you're at all interested in volunteering with us. And I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Um, essentially, you know, if you, if you have a genuine um, desire to help, um, email us and we will figure something out. Um, we also accept Donna in the form of uh, American dollars. Uh, so you could do that also. And I think Noam put some links in the chat. Yeah, um, we're doing our best to be sort of post-capitalist or capitalist adjacent as much as we can. Um, so please only give if you're giving freely uh, of resources that you feel an abundance uh, of into the Sangha. So thank you. And uh, then I have one announcement, which is that we've started a class that's going to run on a series of Tuesday nights. Um, and this class grew out of, um, you know, gestures broadly at everything that's happening right now, um, out of this kind of uh, socio-political, historical moment. And we were having internal discussions amongst ourselves about what do we do as meditators here? We have this bit of technology, of meditation technology um, that we can use, but it also doesn't feel right to kind of go to the metaphorical um, cave and just practice, um, or as my dad would say, gaze at our navels. Um, but what can we do out in the world also? And so we were asking ourselves, where's that balance between inner work and outer work? And we thought, well, we're collective, let's ask the teachers. And so now we have so far 10 different teachers, including MC Owens, um, all showing up on a different Tuesday and answering that question. How do we as meditators meet this moment? Um, and I think Noam put a link. Um, you can see more information about that. It's every Tuesday, but we are having people register in advance um, so that we can create a community of people who care about this, who can talk to each other. 
So register for that in advance and show up on Tuesdays. And um, otherwise, see you all back here next Sunday. This just keeps getting better and better. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for being here. It's, it's building up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Katie, Michael. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Thank